In more ancient times, it was widely accepted and believed that a man's greatest importance revolved around leaving behind the legacy of his life, his knowledge and wisdom to his son. But sometimes that person might be a son they never knew they had. Sort of like... Patty Smith, Element, Spirit, Zodiac Taurus, April 29th, Blood Type O. Patty is the eldest of the two children born between Olivia and Patrick Smith. Born Patricia as a feminine version of her father's name, this was in accordance with Roman naming conventions at the time, like how her mother's name Olivia comes from her father being named Oliver. The name Patrick, and similarly Patricia, comes from the Latin Patricius, meaning nobleman or of noble origin, suggesting that the Smith family may have at one point been part of a very prestigious blacksmithing guild, and may have even made weapons for more than one king's campaign. With such a legacy already behind their family, Patty showed a lot of interest in smithing and the forge from a very early age, a similar to their sister Imo. Even doing small tasks in the forge with Patrick was a big point of accomplishment and pride for the young Patty. And now that they're a teen, 14 exactly, they're also a full-time apprentice to the craft. I mean, Patrick does say, uh, The closest I'll ever have to my son is my pie. So he started seeing his eldest child as someone who can proudly take on his namesake and his forge. Patty is very rough and tumble. They're good at breaking out of a hold when they want to. <laughs> you think you could catch me if I didn't want to be caught, Thomas McNamara? They're sturdy enough to tussle with Shane, who has to contest Martin every day. And they're generally regarded by peers with a sort of big brother feel. Everyone except two people. Tam McNamara and Blair Campbell. Now, Blair is a year older than Patty, but Tam's still younger. Regardless of this, he'd like nothing more than to marry them, and at least Patty seems to show that kind of interest in him. Now, some of you may have recognized already that I'm using a gender-neutral they to refer to Patty. Well, that's because, generally speaking, through the story, Patty does use feminine pronouns to refer to themselves. But there have been side projects in different alternate universes where Patty has even used masculine pronouns and gone through some sort of transition. So when I use gender neutral they them, it should be understood that I'm speaking generally across all different versions of Patty that exist in the multiverse of the Toa storyline. Incongruence with gender and sexual identity is as old as humans have existed. There are many examples of such people dating back all the way before Common Era, so it's not far flung to suggest that such a person exists in 1300 Scotland. Okay, but is she really trans? Yes, I can hear some of you thinking it. Remember, Patty was featured in one of my LGBTQ Pride videos last June, still right there alongside Tam. But what does it all mean? Well, I did say we'd be showing more unrepentantly queer characters, right? For Bree and I, transgender and gender non-conforming people is just a normal way of life. My step-parent is non-binary, Zazem, and one of Bree's siblings is a trans woman. And even Andrew is really gender non-conforming. But that's way in the far-flung future. Even so, you guys are seeing a move toward that in modern times. It gets better, I promise. And now, that's not to try and erase tomboys or heterosexual love or whatever, even anachronistically. Tam wouldn't consider himself as gay for being with Patty. Uh, the most you could get him to admit was he's probably bisexual. But that's neither here nor there. We'll save that for we're talking about Tam. So let's talk about the difference between what a tomboy is and a transgender man. Tomboy is a term has existed since at least the 1500s, according to Oxford Dictionary. While modern definitions of the word tomboy are used to refer to girls or young women that display masculine traits like wearing androgynous or unfeminine clothing or having hobbies and interests usually associated with boys and men, the etymology of the word suggests it's drastically changed over the years. In 1533, the term tomboy meant a rude, boisterous, or forward boy. Basically, Shane. 
In the early 1500s, shame would have been called a tomboy. This is because it's a compound word combining tom and boy. Tom, in this case, generally referring to the rude or boisterous part. Think of the phrase tomcat and how it refers to a male cat that hasn't been neutered. Yeah, now it's starting to make sense. By 1570, the term tomboy began to refer to a bold or immodest woman. Knowing what we know about that era of time and Heinrich Kramer's witch hunters, we can make a pretty good guess that tomboyish girls were more than likely also accused of witchcraft. <sighs> Damn, it's always going to come back that somewhere, isn't it? Jeez, being in the past as a woman freaking sucked. Anyway, it wasn't until the 1600s when the witch hunts were starting to stop that the more modern understanding of tomboys came up and has remained like that for well over 400 years. A girl who behaves like a spirited or boisterous boy. A wild, romping girl. So girls who like, what, fighting, sports, being active? I guess that's why so many athletes who are women are just written as tomboys. I mean, I guess it makes sense. Psychologists have studied that childhood tomboy behavior results from girls' innate curiosity combined with things like family dynamics and imposed gender societal roles and behavioral customs. The desire for athletics and masculine clothing can be explained by adolescent tomboys' curiosity about outdoors and physical games, so comfortable clothing like pants and a jersey help them with physical activities. Now sure, that makes sense. My friend Ella is a martial artist and she's always dressed really laid back and comfortable. People of the Middle Ages believed very much in what we now call the Playground Movement. Said to be founded by Joseph Lee, an American social worker, author, and philanthropist who... was also a proponent of eugenics and a major financial supporter for the Immigration Restriction League in Boston... Gross! Okay, so sure, that guy was a turd, but his ideals around play were the basic understanding of childhood development during the Middle Ages. Mostly children who were older than 6 but younger than 13 spent their days playing with toys, games, or other activities. This falls in line with what the playground movement suggests and is probably the basis for its inception. A lot of these nationalist types like to harken back to the Middle Ages of some kind of golden era before all the queerness and other races ruined or changed everything, but the French Moors were a European people of color and queerness has always been a part of history. Yes, including transgender people. I have to reference an article from the Public Media List for this because it was just fantastic. Written by Gabriel Bachowski in, in 2018. Title? Were there transgender people in the Middle Ages? Answer? Yes. <laughs> I'll link the article down below and I encourage you to read all of it. It gets more in depth than just that. And so what is the definitive difference between a tomboy and a trans man? It might sound conscientious to some, but the answer is very simple. Tomboys are still women, and trans men are men. Regardless of what authors like Abigail Schreier might try to tell you, gender dysphoria isn't something that just comes up out of nowhere. It's a well-documented stress that transgender individuals go through when they run into a situation where their gender doesn't feel affirmed. Cisgender people can experience this too. Think of a man who may feel less manly because he's aging. Often men like these will do things to help them feel more affirmed in their manliness, and doing so is considered a healthy practice. Elder men often take medication or to help their body perform more like it did when they were younger, thus retaining their self-image and self-esteem. Similarly, trans men might like to wear more masculine clothes, hair, or even take testosterone to grow a beard or get a deeper voice. Studies from literally every major health organization in the world have proven time and time again that this is the best practice for these individuals. So that's something to consider when we talk about this. And while hormone therapy as we know it didn't start until the 60s, that doesn't mean that in medieval times people did nothing to affirm their gender. Medieval understanding around transness was, of course, not as robust as it was today. There was no understanding of the phrase transgender or gender dysphoria. Instead, a lot of the time with gender in the medieval era, it was basically all on a self-ID basis. If you said you were a man and looked like one, many people would just take that for truth and accept it. Le roman de silence. 
is an octosyllabic verse that was written by Heldris of Cornwall in 1275 CE. Written in the old French Roman Picard dialect, it deals with the concepts of nature versus nurture, sex, gender, and gender roles at the time. And it should bear to mention this text wasn't discovered or translated until 1920 and 1970s respectively, so it's only recently been the subject of study for medievalists and those in the field of Anglo-American gender studies. So, Silence made its way to England in the 1500s as loot from the Hundred Year War. I say likely because it was discovered in 1920s England in a box of old papers. The story of Silence is made up of 84 miniatures. It's an epic romantic poem, but the overall summary is about a girl named Silence whose parents are the rulers of Cornwall. During that time, women weren't allowed to inherit or own land, and Silence was their only child. Silence tells the story of a heroic person who is born assigned female by nature, but who decides to live as a man after a consultation with the forces of nurture and reason. He then is raised as a knight, is trained as a minstrel, and has several heroic adventures. But suffice to say, dressing as a man was an essential part of Silence, being not just a man, but an exemplary one, according to Bachowski. You know, if this poem was written in 1275, that means there's a chance that Madeline or the others might have heard of it, read it, or even have a copy or version of it. Now, we only know of one surviving manuscript that was given to Madame de Lavelle sometime before 1428. Whether or not it was widely distributed or one of its kind is completely unknown. But I'd like to speculate that at least some form of writing or even word of mouth was shared around, making this an uncommon but not unheard of story in our personal series canon. Well, so what else is there to Patty? This is primarily a romance story, so let's talk about their relationships. I mentioned Tam and Blair earlier, so let's talk about that. Now, as I mentioned, Patty is a year younger than Blair Campbell, Danny's older sister by a big margin. Because of this, there were many times in their lives that Patty and Blair would help each other watch over Daniel and the rest of the kids. The adults knew that once Blair exited out of her playing stage, Patty would be the next oldest one, calling the shots, so they needed Patty to be responsible. Well, Blair and Patty not only meshed as what basically amounted to babysitters, but also as friends, since Blair was a bit more adventurous than her other sisters. Patty liked that in her in ways that, well they couldn't really quite understand at first. It felt like more than friendship, but because of their own perceptions and self-image, it made confessing their feelings more difficult. Eventually, they wouldn't have to. Blair was the first one to reveal that she felt the same way, that Patty was different than other girls, but not in that quirky way. Their relationship, though, had to still stay somewhat secretive, since Patty wasn't sure if other folk in Alden, namely her father Patrick, would be willing to understand that deep down, Patty really did want to be his son. But being with Blair made Patty feel more like himself, and the bond quickly grew. Flash forward to Catch and Kiss. If Patty was already romancing Blair, why did they let Tam court them in return? Well, in a lot of the Middle Ages, marriages were seen as transactional business arrangements between families. A marriage between the blacksmith family and the baker family may seen as more profitable or accepted because of Tam and Patty's assigned genders at birth. The Art of Courtly Love, which is written in the 12th century, suggests that true love can have no place between a husband and wife. It was well recognized that often marriages were separate for romantic relationships and that romance was often held in clandestine rendezvous. So, while they do care for Tam, Patty sees their marriage as more of a courtly style, with Blair as a true romance. I don't know how that's going to play out for them, though. I really hope everything works out for the best. We know polyamory swing is a big part of Glaswegian culture, and has been for centuries. We know that Matthias and Tassandra obviously have no problem with thruples and more. I really hope that Patty, Tam, and Blair can have some sort of love they all want and deserve. Let's see, you guys remember the elemental affinities of our characters. Patty is spirit like Elwyn and Bree. Usually we do little things to hint at the element a character belongs to, 
with the colors of design. Eowyn has a purple shirt, Bree has a purple phone, which is all significant because spirit is the element of technology, and Patty has this purple stripe of embroidery down their dress. Color was also extremely important and well used in the Middle Ages. Statues and buildings were often painted brightly, and clothing, when available, made use of pops of color as well. That being said, colored dye was expensive, and despite having more freedom in Alden, the Smith Forge did see a downturn in work, but that was with Patrick's failing eyesight. So, this is also the reason why they used colors that were cheaper to come across at the time, and thus more common. Browns, reds, gray, but always with a pop of color included. Spirit is the element of technology, and that is because according to Chinese spirituality, spirit, also known as metal, is the element of mankind's intuition, with using metal and other tools to further our progression as a world culture. Think about it. The use of tools is considered by many scientists to be a true mark of intelligence, and in ancient times, it showed that creature had a soul. This is why ravens were also commonly associated with souls, spirits, fae, or the dead. Crows would be the most common creature at the time to have shown to use tools and other higher cognitive functions that humans thought was exclusive to them. So, a young person who uses metal to help further their village and help it prosper? Plus, I heard Patty's taken a special interest in a manuscript written by Roger Bacon sometime around the year they were born. But I'll have to let that go for now. I'll discuss that with you next time Patty's character comes up. Art for this week is Shellac on Fiverr. Check the link down in the description for their business. Another quick, a couple other quick updates. Episode four, Night of the Puka, is scheduled for this spring. Like, subscribe, and ring my bell so you don't miss it. <clears throat> Excuse me. Also, Patreon is the best way to support this channel. Not only are you supporting us, but then we turn around and change that money into great art, music, voiceovers, comics, maybe even merch like shirts, hats, or plushies one day. But you'll get access to the Tales of Hunt coloring pages, the Monument comic book, music tracks, and even the Monomyth ebooks that you can read the story of Season 1 months before it's YouTube, all for only $1 per month. Check the link if you want to look into that. Some of our great patrons include Shadow Fox, Arya Gamari, Charles Tam, Jace Morland, and Lunder Lumen. Thanks for watching, everyone.